Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Or. Tom, how's it going? Tony, we're about to do one of my absolute favorite kinds of shows, because this is the kind of show where beloved lit readers and members of Buckeyescoop.com have done the show for us, and we just get to tell them when they're wrong. That's the best. It is the best, and I'm glad we came up with this idea. And uh, you know, we don't have to look bad. We can make others look bad. We can talk about how bad they look. Maybe talk about how good they look as well, but not like overly complimentary because we've got to, you know, we've got to keep it real here. Yeah, I mean, they're they're members of the site. We don't want to look like we're we're being impartial here. So we have to be perhaps even a little bit overly harsh to avoid appearing that we're showing them too much favoritism. That's a good thought, Tom. And so what, what today's show is, there's a thread on the Ask the Insiders message board about bold predictions for this season, uh, bold Big Ten, Ohio State, national predictions. And we thought, you know what, let's go through them and laugh at them, uh, pick on them, basically be the bullies that we've always wanted to be, but have never gotten that many, uh, you know, uh, many opportunities to do, or also tell them, begrudgingly yeah, okay I, I i guess i can see <laughs> i can see that now i haven't gone through these and looked at them entirely so i guess that's one way for me to be oh oh that that does sound bold <laughs> is sort of when the first time i'm reading it or hearing it and that maybe helps me gauge it tom i'm not sure what you're going to do on how to gauge this because you've already read them i have already read them i i you know, I tried to keep the ones that were more bold in here and, and pare down some of the ones that were kind of, you know, like less spicy versions of these. Because, you know, there was one that was, uh, you know, Mayan Williams finishes with, uh, you know, eight touchdowns. And then the other one, you know, th there were others that were much more, you know, much more bold than that. So, yeah, we tried to tried to keep it to the bolder ones, but, uh, you know, also the somewhat reasonable ones that, uh, you know. Not like Ohio State, Michigan's played on Mars. Like what? Why? That's not. I don't think that's no. So yeah, don't give us I some think, Flanders chili cookoff stuff here, because <laughs> you will go to jail. You will go to jail. Yes, and it is time for chili, so we should probably get started. So what's the right, first uh, thing I've got? Let's see. I'm going to start with. Uh, let's see. I'm going to start with Alave for Heisman. Uh, Rutgers keeps the score closer with Ohio State than Michigan will. Thoughts. I I I like it. Does that make it bold? I agree with it. Does that make it bold? Um, gosh, that's pretty good, Tom. Just off off the off the cuff. But again, is that? I guess it's bold because Rutgers is who they are. Michigan is uh, maybe a level above them if you give them enough overtimes. Correct. Um, so this. Based on the last couple of games that have been blowouts, yeah, I can see it. I guess, Tom, I will call it bold and agree that this is going to happen, but it's not as bold as it used to be, that's for sure. It is definitely not as bold as it was a couple of years ago, you know, late uh, Chris Ash era, Rutgers, you know, still a live version of Michigan under Jim Harbaugh. Like a couple of years ago, that would have been crazy. Now it's like, yeah, I mean, Ohio State will absolutely be favored by more against Rutgers than they will against Michigan. Those are both road games this year. It just, it feels like you're going to, that's going to happen. And it's going to happen like with a backdoor kind of cover, like, you know, like, like last, last year's game where Ohio State was up, but, you know, 35 nothing or whatever it was at halftime against Rutgers or right before halftime. And then Rutgers just did a bunch of dumb stuff. And it was just like, how is this still a game in the fourth quarter? Like it was still like theoretically possible. Rutgers was in striking distance in the fourth quarter. This, you know, you, you kind of lose focus. You're at Rutgers. It's kind of like, eh, whatever. It's going to be 27,000 people there. Ohio State doesn't ever seem to lose focus in Ann Arbor. Like that, that, that is never, that is never a problem. Oh, Michigan gets Ohio State's best shot every year. And Ohio State's best shot is pretty darn good. So I think I think I actually think this is, you know, realistic. I don't know. I not guaranteed to happen, but I think it's mm -hmm. it's very realistic for this to happen. But the way it happens is, you know, Ohio State's up by 28 at halftime, and then all of a sudden they win the game by 17 and they beat Michigan by 20 or something like that. Right. Now it's your turn. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm going to go. Oh, <laughs> so this I is have how to take taking these. turns works. We should Tony, have talked about this before the show. 
Oh, I thought you were. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. I can, I can, I thought we were taking turns. I thought, I thought that was, oh, that's fine. That's we fine. Should, you know what? That's what? fine. I'll just, I'll, I'll just run through them. You can, you can just react, react to the relative boldness or non-boldness. All right. We, we're good at podcasting. We're only, we're, you know, once, once we get, you know, another 300 or so episodes in, we're really going to have yeah. this thing under control. We'll, good. We'll, we'll hit it. Yeah. All right. Another one from Alave for Heisman. No one Ohio State plays before the playoff will keep it within single digits, and Ohio State will enter the playoff as a one seed. Um, I disagree. There will be some single digit games, at least in the first quarter. So, <laughs> um, because you can't start out ten nothing. So nobody within in the first in the season in the regular season uh, before, no, the before the Gee, playoff before the playoff before okay. the playoff. So that includes Big Ten championship mm, game. You know that's really rare to do that. Like. Um, Nebraska did that in like 95 or something like that. And people, teams had to go a long time before somebody else did. I think Alabama may have done it last year. Um, it, it does not happen every year. So I, uh, I guess, I guess it has to be bold if I disagree with it. But Tom, I, I don't know where I disagree with it in, on the schedule. I just, I disagree with it in general because it's so difficult to do. But, like who's who, who's going to hold them within ten or within nine? I, I, I don't yeah, know. I, I will. I will point out Ohio State did this two years ago, two thousand nineteen. Mm-hmm. Every game up to and including the Big Ten championship game was uh, at least an eleven point win. Mm-hmm. Ohio State. The, the closest one was the Penn State game, which was not really that close, but you know ended up looking that close. You know, I, I and and last year it was you know. Oh, you had the the big comeback from uh, Indiana where Ohio State was up 35 to seven on Indiana and then just kind of ended up inching back in. That's the only time that this has happened against Ohio State in the last three years. Going back to, you know, before that, you got to go back to the uh, the Maryland game, the uh, d- the overtime Maryland game uh, in 2018 for that to happen. So I, I honestly, I don't know if I think this is quite as bold as it might seem on the surface because it really didn't happen very much. I mean, you're right. It is historically very anomalous. There was that 95 Nebraska team was famous because they did that. And it was like the one that game that was even kind of close. They were up by a million and then someone scored a late touchdown or two to kind of make it look a little, a little closer. But yeah, I, I think that, I think this is entirely like entirely possible. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it, you know, they're, they're favored by double digits against everyone. So, you know, in, you know, you're going to have a game where you don't cover. You're not going 12 and 0 against the spread during the regular season. If you are, the price of real estate in Ohio is going to go up because everyone's going to be like, "I'm rich." <laughs> so it, it I, I, I don't think this is quite as bold as it might seem on the surface, just because the gap between Ohio State and pretty much the rest of the Big Ten is so big right now. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go with, agree with you there because they've basically done it two years in a row. That Indiana game, whatever you want to say about it, that was, I mean, granted, it, it didn't end up by more than. Than ten, but it was still Ohio State could have named that score if they wanted to. So, yeah, I guess if if they've done it two years in a row, essentially, then mm-hmm. I guess predicting it to happen a third year in a row, maybe is bold that you expect it to happen a third year in a row. But in a vacuum, expecting it to happen this year, I'm going to say, Tom, yeah, no, no boldo, no boldo, no boldo. All right. So next one, uh, this is a good one from RC Three Miller. So there's some heat here. Maryland finished the second in the Big Ten East. That that's bold. That's spicy. That is a brand new barbecue sauce that you put some flames on. It might have a waiver on the back. <laughs> I uh, I I can't I can't I can't go with that. Especially just coming off of uh, the uh, a previous morning scoop that we did with win totals. When I was thinking about going under on Maryland and six wins. So I I don't feel comfortable about Maryland. I just I don't trust Mike Loxley. I don't trust their quarterbacks because they're always getting hurt. I don't trust certainly don't trust their defense. I think there's enough um, mush in the Big Ten East to where it's kind of like the Big Ten West, where nobody really stands out because everybody's taking bringing each other down. I can see Rutgers. I mean Mar- Maryland has to go to Rutgers. I can see. I would. Rutgers winning that game would not be any big thing. And I think that's any, any time Maryland goes on the road, they should lose. Yeah. And, and I think the interesting thing with Maryland is they're better 
and everyone I think is maybe getting like two steps ahead of how much better Maryland is. Like they've now they're starting to get the pieces. They're doing the Mike Loxley thing where it's like, how did they get a five star receiver? Like how where did that where did that come from? But they don't have the five star everything. They don't have the four star everything yet. So I don't know that they're going to be consistent enough to be a second place team in the Big Ten East. They are they're probably they're at the level where it's like, wait, Maryland beat who? Like what? How did that happen? And then the next week they'll lose a really stupid game to Rutgers or Michigan State or someone like that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not I'm not on board with with Maryland finishing second. I am on board with Maryland beats Penn State this year, or Maryland beats Michigan this year, or Maryland beats mm-hmm. you know Indiana. Like Maryland will beat a Maryland. There's a better chance that Maryland beats the second place team than Maryland is the second place team in the Big Ten East. I would say, unless there's like a four way tie at five and four. <laughs> oh man, that is what was the word you used earlier? Mush? mush. Like, yes, that would be that would be the Big Ten, Big Ten West and the Big Ten Mush. Like, oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, here's another one from RC3 Miller. Penn State finishes third. James Franklin finally takes the USC job. He always seems to be the candidate for. Um, I like I like the uh, the the addition of the James Frank, Franklin to USC. I don't think Penn State finishing third is bold because um is he, is is it bold because they're not finishing second or i, I it, assume I assume because it's not finishing second but they didn't okay. finish second last year so right so i mean they're a third they're a third place program in general i know that's also michigan's place but they can share and they, they share very well uh so i don't know that that's bold james franklin taking another job to me isn't bold either i just uh, coaching moves are fun so you know that that's a thing i i would call this i don't know if it's bold uh, how about tangy that it's a little it's a little tangy there's a little zip there uh now i'm gonna go with two more from rc3 miller i thought he had some good ones uh good ones for the uh the big 10 overall uh this is kind of, i'm gonna just he had these as two separate ones i'm gonna combine them because i think that people people think that the answer to the first one is going to be the answer to the second one and rc miller respectfully disagrees on both counts matt campbell goes to the nfl michigan's next coach is hired from their current staff Go ahead. I, I don't. I don't know if I see Matt Campbell as an NFL coach. I mean, what's his name from uh, Baylor is now coaching the uh, Carolina Matt Panthers. Rule. Matt Rule. So, you know, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But he just he just seems like a college coach to me. He he was a small college guy. I just I I don't see him going to the NFL. Who who on Michigan staff is the next head? Like who on the Michigan staff is the next head coaching kind of material? Because Here's the problem you're going to have there. That program has kind of had this like cultural dry rot for about four years now. And you, you, when you are at the point where, you know, if they continue to lose, they continue to not recruit particularly well. Like that's when you just kind of like, you know, you tent the house and you just fumigate it and it's like, get everything out and just start all brand new. Cause, cause you can't, you can't just, you know, you, that that's not like a, well, maybe we'll just, you know, like, you know, replace the, uh, replace the countertops, replace, reface the cabinets, and that'll be good enough instead of like gutting the kitchen. Like, no, that you need to, if, if you are at the point where they're going seven and five this year, six and six, whatever, you lose to Ohio State by 20 points again, like at that point, like you got to strip it down to the studs. It's not like there's some fantastic recruiting class coming in that they have to keep in like that. And, and there's no one on that staff that I jumps out to me immediately as like, this guy is a future star head coach in waiting like I, Josh Gaddis, like eh, whatever John Howard. Yeah. I think, he, I think he's busy. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think he can do the, the multi-sport thing, unfortunately, but yeah, I, that one, I, almost of all the ones on this list, that's the one that I think is almost the most unlikely. You, I mean, it's, you bring in Jay Harbaugh after Jim Harbaugh. No, I mean, it's just, I, I don't, I don't know what else you're, I don't know what else you're doing there. So yeah, I, I think those two are pretty unlikely, but you know, I mean, they, they are bold. They're definitely bold. I know people, some people swear that Matt Campbell is not going to go to Michigan. So I will, I will side with those guys. I think he's, I personally think he's sitting and waiting for Notre Dame or Ohio state to open up. Ohio state would have to, you know, Ryan day would have to go to the NFL, Brian Kelly. I mean, there was NFL talk with him. I think that's probably by the wayside. Maybe he gets fired for constantly losing in the playoffs. I, 
<laughs> I don't know how much longer Matt Campbell can wait on that because I don't know that any either of those two guys are going anywhere. I keep saying the next Michigan head coach is going to be Jeff Halfley, and I nothing that I'm thinking has me thinking other you know nothing I've heard has me thinking differently. I think it would be a, a, a great hire. Base, well, we'll see what happens this year at Boston College. But you want a culture change, that's a guy who has nothing to do with Michigan. And and he gives you the, the East Coast recruiting ground, which you love so much. Keep that fertile, fertile Massachusetts farmland uh, producing producing the players you know you love. Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean, I, I know, I've heard you say that before. And every time I just kind of go, oh, like, ah, uh, I... I get it. Like, I know, I think he would do a great job there. I don't, I don't have a question about that. I think he would do a great job there. I just, I think that would be, uh, that would, that would be quite, quite a jump. And I don't know if Michigan is, that, that would be quite a change from Michigan's traditional uh, hiring practices. I don't know if they are visionary enough to be willing to do that. That's, How much would the media that covers Michigan love that hire and that, that change from talking to Jim Harbaugh to talking to Jeff Halfley. Oh, I, I mean, that would be that, that would be as different as you could possibly be going from from Jim Harbaugh, who won't say anything and and is a complete weirdo, to Jeff Halfley, who that we were we were so sad when Jeff Halfley left because it was like, but we'll, can we can we still interview you every week? Because it was we like that. That was fun. You just get honest answers, and when he wouldn't tell you know when he couldn't tell you the answer, he would just say, listen. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just not going to answer that question. Like, it's like, all right, cool. I got to tell you, I appreciate it. Thank you for not lying to me. That's uh, that's there's, great. There was also times where he'd say something. He's like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. And then, <laughs> and then he'd say it that. anyway. <laughs> so that would be such a culture change for just the media that uh, they would love it. So I, I'm rooting for that for them. And then, then you've got the whole Ryan Day, Jeff Halfley. Woody Hayes, Bo Schembechler thing that could uh, stir some stuff up there as well. Yeah. And, and he's, I mean, he's the kind of guy who I think they would probably have immediate success on the recruiting trail with him. And, uh, you know, and then you, you don't catch Ohio state overnight, but if you give him time, you give him five years, you've got a team that's at least consistently second place. And, you know, it, it's not like Ohio state is guaranteed to stay in the current spot. Halfley, if they hire him, he's someone who improves their talent level enough that they can become a consistent like eight, ten in the country. And under the new playoff format, whenever that goes into effect, mm -hmm. you're a playoff team. And then once you're a playoff team, you're in and you see what happens. But yeah, I, I that that is the best thing I think they could possibly do. I don't, I would not bet on them doing that. But that's I think the best thing they could possibly do. Uh, how about this one from Gunnison Buckeye? Garrett Wilson sets an OSU single game record for receiving yards against Akron in the first half. Just to remind you, uh, the record all time, uh, Terry Glenn, nine catches for 253 yards against Pitt in 1995. That is, that's bold. I, and it's not like uh, there's no way that could happen because that could happen on four or five catches and mm -hmm. that would be done. Now, would you need to throw to him more than three times in that game in that first half? No. Could you do it because you want, just want to get your quarterback some work? Yes. I really, really like that prediction. I, I like the boldness. I like the, just the, it's not standard. It's your setting record and it's in one half. I like everything about that. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I, I would put that one up on the wall. I like that one a lot. What, what about you? I, I like it a lot. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the uh, Garrett Wilson has uh, no receiving yards after halftime in the Akron. I don't think that one's particularly bold. <laughs> I think that's definitely going to happen. But yeah, I, I don't. I, that's just it's a lot, and I think that's a game where you, you're probably looking to spread the ball around a little bit. Like you're gonna, you know, that's that's a game where you would love to get, you know. Chris Olave is going to want the ball sometimes like you're, you're and they're going to want to throw Second the ball half. to Chris Olave. Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to want the ball sometimes. And you're going to want to, you know, guess what? Guess what? Running backs are going to want to run the ball too. They have a whole bunch of running backs to, uh, to feed the ball too. So yeah, I, I don't think not that it couldn't happen. Not that, you know, because that, that game is, uh, you know, one of the early season EA sports games where you put the game thing down on junior varsity difficulty and uh, just, just pump stats up there. They absolutely could do that but I don't think they will do that. 
And the fact that it's an in-state school means they probably keep their foot off the gas a little bit more and try and, you know, show some respect for the in-state well, uh, sportsmanship. Who needs what, it? That's what I say. <laughs> what happens, though, if uh, Akron coach Tom Arth, 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 uh, Arth during a, say, coaches meeting accuses, say, Ryan Day of some improper in-state recruiting or something like that mm-hmm. and... Mm-hmm. maybe maybe raises some ire or maybe says mm-hmm. um garrett wilson isn't any good he's just throwing out some friendly uh fr- friendly shots to the buckeye side and then if ohio state wanted to put 254 yards up in the first half with garrett <laughs> wilson tom would they need the second quarter i i, I think the real question is could ohio state hang 100 in the first half and the answer is Probably that could probably happen. <laughs> I don't know that you'd even need too many, uh, too many uh, onside kicks to do that. I think that's a real possibility. If now I think, uh, I think Tom Arth, I don't know Tom Arth per earth personally. I'm going to assume Tom Arth is smart enough to not uh, poke the bear in that kind of way, but you know, Hey, as people who cover the team and they're always looking for stories to write, that would be a fun story to write that week. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> no. uh, here's another one from Gunnison. Here's another one from Gunnison Buckeye. Sawyer and Tua Malowau combined for 12 sacks for the year. Go ahead. I want to hear you. I, I mean, it's high. It's real high. I mean, we've talked about the fact that you, you, your baseline expectation for a five-star freshman defensive end is three and a half sacks. I think that so that would put him at about seven between them. Is it out of the realm of possibility that one of them has three and a half and the other one puts up, you know, eight? No, you know, and then it's, you know, eight and four or nine and three and a half or something. It's, it's not as crazy as it sounds. How many did Joe, Joey Bosa have as a freshman? Seven and a half? Am I remembering that right? They're about, maybe a little bit more than that, but seven and a half sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you, you have a Joey Bosa freshman year out of one of them and the other one puts up, Four and a half. I mean, that's it's much more within the realm of possibility than a lot of the stuff that's on this list. I think it's I think it's a little aggressive. It's definitely bold. I think it's a little aggressive. I would never predict that myself because I think it's probably a little irresponsible to put that on uh, on a pair of freshmen. But it's not it's not as crazy as you might think. Yeah, seven and a half for Joey Bosa in 2013. Nick Bosa. Had I believe we have five, so you're 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 saying that both, on average, JT Tumaloa and Jack Sawyer are going to do more than what Nick Bosa did when they may be further in, behind in line of the rotation. To me, yeah, sure, it's bold. I don't see it happening. That is that that's a lot just based on you know as you said what we've seen. Uh, how do you feel about say nine? If I go eight and a half, Tom, eight and a half total sacks between them. Are we doing an over under or are we doing, is this bold or no, is no, this no. realistic? Go, go give me over under eight and a half. Cause I think, I think it's realistic. It's a little bold though. I, I don't know. Is it bold? It's, it's, I think I'd go, oh, I think go under that. Just, I mean, I'm just trying to be responsible here and set realistic expectations for the freshman. I, I'd probably go under that, but I mean, it's, that's not eight and a half is not crazy at all. Uh, here's, here's one. I'll just, I'll just do one on my own. Uh, Jack Sawyer and or JT to sets the single game Ohio state sack record against Akron just in the second half. <laughs> is that four and a half? Or it- uh, I'm trying to remember what Chase Young had against, uh, what did Chase Young have against, uh, Wisconsin a couple of years ago? I think it was four, right? Uh, let me see here. Um, play the music, Tom, play the, uh, thinking music. <laughs> um, <laughs> He had four, and I believe Jason Gwynn also yeah. had four one year. So you're looking four and a half against sacks. Indiana. Yeah, yeah, four and a half sacks. Yeah, I mean, I, that sounds That's that boring. sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot. And and you know how much is Akron going to have the ball in the second half of that game? I mean, they're going to be running mean, the ball just to get out of dodge. I think I think that's absolutely true. So yeah, I think I think uh, circumstances will probably uh, play against that. But I mean, Jason Gwynn was a freshman when he did it in 1993 against Indiana. So it's not, I think he was a redshirt freshman, but uh, yeah, that's not, not the craziest, uh, you know, it's crazy, but it's not as crazy as you might think. Now, what if say uh, they try to run the ball, Tom, and say JT to stops the running back in the backfield, takes the ball and gives it to the quarterback and says, you throw it. And then he takes <laughs> 
forced flea flicker. I like it. That's that's good. I like I like the uh, I like the strategy there. Uh, next one from Frambies Avenue. Clemson and Alabama both missed the playoff in 2021, and Alabama misses the SEC title game. Is this bold or wishful thinking? Is, can, I, it, can it be both? I, I, it it can be both. Uh, Who's going to go? Who goes? I mean, is it Texas A and M that goes from the West? Yeah, Tex- probably Texas A and M goes for the West. I mean, maybe LSU if LSU if everything Ole breaks Miss. right. It's probably yeah. It's probably if you uh, remember our uh, morning scoop show from uh, last last week when we went through uh, over unders. You know, Tony is long on Ole Miss. Uh, I, I I think it's entirely possible one of them misses the playoff. I just I need you to walk me through the scenario where Clemson loses two games in the regular season. Like I, they lose to Georgia week one. And then it's like, well, they have at Syracuse and at, uh, they've they are at NC State. They have Pitt the, as the second of back to back road road games. Like maybe, but you know, there's a possibility they beat Georgia. That's probably about a coin flip. And if they beat Georgia, they could lose a game or two. They might lose two games. And if they win the in the ACC, but they beat Georgia, they're probably in the playoff anyway. I mean, there's no one else. I mean, unless you're thinking, you know, unless they lose uh, to NC State in the ACC championship game, maybe you lose to Georgia and you lose to NC State in the ACC championship game, maybe. But I mean, their regular season schedule is not too, not too tough outside of that Georgia game. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's bold. It's possible. It is absolutely possible because I don't know, you know, the, the talent gap is pretty good between Clemson and the rest of the ACC, but if you lose that Georgia game, you're, you don't have a ton of margin of error and, and North Carolina is better than the teams they typically have to play in that ACC championship game. So yeah, it's, I, I'm kind of talking myself into this, not being nuts. So, and, and they don't even play North Carolina in a regular season. So they, they right, but they'll, they'll there. have to play it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They'll have to play them in the ACC title I, game over under one, one, one point five. One of these, one and a half of these teams makes the playoff. I'm going over. So one one of these teams makes the playoff or misses no, the playoff. Of these two, like mm-hmm. one point five of them, you know, basically, is, is one going to make that make miss it or will both make it? I'm going both making it. I'm going to say one of them misses it because I think Oklahoma's probably there out of the Big Twelve. I think Ohio State's probably there out of the Big Ten. You know, the crazier things have happened. It is possible for a Pac-12 team, technically, technically possible for a Pac-12 team to make the playoff. I don't think it's going to happen, but yeah, I mean, you get Clemson, you get Ohio State, Georgia is going to be up there. Georgia, you know, Georgia maybe get an SEC bid, and then that's three, and then you've got only one of these teams left. So I'm going to say under one and a half of these teams make the college football playoff, but over 0. 0.5. I, I I I like the uh, the Alabama thing because again, on that that show the morning scoop we did, we both had Alabama under, and then mm-hmm. so that's assuming a loss in the regular season. And then mm-hmm. you lose to Georgia in a title game, and boom, you're out. Yeah. Well, very. You, you yeah, say that. Right. You say that. Would you like me to tell you what's going to get said? Uh, what Kirk, what Kirk, Kirk Herbst is going to say on the uh, Saturday night after they uh, after they lose that AC, that SEC championship game? The committee needs to pin their ears back. Let me tell you about the heart of a champion, Tony. Let me tell you about the de- the depth and difficulty of the schedule. And how challenging it is to make it through an SEC schedule. And Tony, let me tell you how many teams in other conferences would not be able to run the, the gauntlet, Tony, the gauntlet that Alabama has just been forced to run. And frankly, Tony, I'm a little offended that you would suggest that they don't blow in the playoff. You know who else is offended by that? Nick Saban. Oh, okay. And probably, probably Nick Saban's daughter. <laughs> I'm sure she'll let us know. Uh, from Evang23, Lathan Ransom and Ryan Watts start every single game this year. Uh, the Ryan Watts thing is... is- Pretty bold, even though he left the spring as the number one guy. We're all just assuming Cameron Brown will do something. I, um, boy, I, I like this one, Tom, because I do believe Lathan Ransom will win the cover cover safety job over Marcus Williamson, even though Marcus Williamson has said last year was a learning experience and he's a better player now than he was last year. The Ryan Watts thing, um, and it's pretty bold. But I mean, it's just, it's also time. You know, it's you you better do it now. I don't know if I agree with it, but I I think the only reason I would disagree with it is because I'm not sure what Cameron Brown is up to yet. 
Um, Tom, I'm going to say I'm, I, I agree that it's bold. I'm trying to wrap myself around agreeing with it. But I, I guess I, there are too many questions with the corners right now. I, I can't agree with it, but I guess that makes it somewhat bold. It, it is somewhat bold. It's within the realm of possibility. It's not like, mm. you know, one of the true freshman corners comes in and starts every game this year. I don't think, you know, I don't think that's happening. You've got enough questions about Cam Brown's health that like maybe, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think the Lathan Ransom half of this is somewhere between possible and, you know, pla- you know, plausible and likely maybe the Ryan Watts thing, Ryan Watts starts three games this year. Ryan Watts starts six games this year. Yeah. I could, I could see that potentially as a possibility. I just, I don't know if you, I don't know if you get every single, I mean, every single game and he wrote every in all caps. So, you know, he meant it. So yeah, I think every single game is probably going to be more than, you know, more than you expect. And you know, sometimes guys get hurt. Like that's a thing that happens mm-hmm. too. So that would, that would make it more, le- less likely to happen. Well, how many players will, would you uh, even, so how many players would you even put down as I think they will start every game? It's, it's not a lot because injuries and rotation, you know, Chris Olave, I assume will start every game. Jackson Smith and Jigman mm-hmm. may not because they may go with two tight ends instead, or, you know, mm-hmm. maybe Mayan Williams starts this week instead of master Teague. So there's a saying every single game, you know, I, maybe there's a three man rotation at corner and one week it's Brian Watts. And next week it's Cam Brown next to seven banks. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's some things to think about there other than just he's the best one. Right. And yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say Alave Wilson, the five offensive linemen, if they're healthy, Jeremy Ruckert, probably unless they start four wide and you know, whoever's the quarterback is presumably the starter all year, unless he gets hurt. I mean, you, you can go around the offense, but it's like, yeah, you're right. Running back, you know, slot receiver versus second tight end. I mean, there's a bunch of spots where, just a, a minor shift in the formation. Everyone can stay healthy and you still don't start every single game. That's uh, and you know, sometimes they start guys because they're in their home state. A couple of years ago, they started Javante Jean Baptiste and Tyler Friday at defensive end because they were playing at Rutgers and they're both New Jersey guys. Like that's that's a thing that happens too. So I think you there, there's a bunch of ways you can lose that one. So mm-hmm. it's bold. Away. I like it. It's it's not crazy. It's not as crazy as it sounds, but I think it's not gonna happen. Uh, another one from Evang. Uh, one more bold prediction that will probably have people thinking I'm crazy. I predict OSU beats Oregon by more than they beat Minnesota. Here's, here's the thinking. The first game being a road game with rookie quarterback and a secondary that isn't full of superstars may need to do a super sloppy first half. May even be some bad play calling that game as well. I still think Ohio State wins that game by at least 17, but it could be ugly at first. Week two, Ohio State understands how big of a game that is. Starts out hot from the start. I think you'd expect Day to try and expose that Oregon defense early and often. The game where you don't want to take your foot off the gas at all if they get a lead, and also a game where you can do some style points. So... Thoughts. Does Ohio State beat Oregon by more than they beat Minnesota? Tom, can it be a bold prediction if there's a sound foundation and explanation behind it? I mean, it can, it can be. I mean, there's a I, I, I don't disagree with any of it because yeah. I don't think they're beating Minnesota by 40 points. Like it just your first game of the season on the road, young quarterback, you're probably they're probably gonna be leaning on the run game a decent amount in that one. You're you get out in front, it's like get the heck out of Dodge and get exactly. back home and, and yeah, I mean I, I, I think that's and and it's you know, Ohio State could be leading that one by twenty one points at halftime and win it by seventeen, like he like he said. I mean that like that's a possibility too. They're better than Minnesota, but I don't know that uh I don't I don't know that I think they're gonna blow Minnesota out. The Oregon one is interesting because it's like, yeah, they they could, they absolutely could because they do have they have Oregon's good. Oregon is a pretty good defense. Oregon has a pretty good offense. They're they're, they're a pretty good all around team. That's a team that's probably going to challenge for, if not win, the Pac-12. But if you know, Ohio State's not saving anything for Minnesota. They may be saving some stuff for Oregon. Or and the other thing he didn't mention that's a noon game Eastern time, so that's nine a.m. or you know Oregon body clock time. You get out to a hot start, maybe it kind of snowballs for you. I, I, it, this is this is so not crazy to, that I'm like almost talking myself into the fact that it's a you know legitimate like legitimate possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's like I, I would. This is like I would not be surprised at all if this happened. No, and I can talk myself into it very easily. I think the difference in the two games is, like you said, you're just trying to get out of dodge against Minnesota, and maybe you just coast to the finish line. Against Oregon, you've got you've got it floored as you're hitting the finish line. You're trying to put as much distance between you and Oregon as possible all game long. 
not only because you want to win that game, but it's it's style points. It's for the committee, and Ryan Day would never say that. But this is just an opportunity. It's it's recruiting. Uh, there's there's a lot of reasons. Conference games just win them. The non-conference games, if you could put a little distance between you and the opponent and really set yourself apart, do it. And, and plus, I don't know that they can let up. They can't afford to let up, and so they wouldn't. Against Minnesota, you stop uh, the running game. You stop. They're not as explosive as Oregon, so you can take things a little bit uh, more lenient or you know, you can settle down in the fourth quarter. Against Oregon, I don't know that there's going to be any settling down in the fourth quarter. They may still be throwing it downfield, even if they're up by 17 or 24. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a, this is, this is the classic SEC thing, right? If you win a close game in the conference, it's because your conference is extremely good. And that just proves how good your conference is. If you win, if you blow out your non conference opponents, there aren't that many cross conference, you know, inter conference data points. So if you, you know, if Ohio State beats Oregon by 20 points, and Michigan beats Washington on that same day by 10, then basically every Ohio, you know, Big 10 versus Pac-12 conversation later, even if it's USC versus Penn State for the fourth playoff spot is going to come down to, well, you know, the Big 10 is better than the Pac-12 because you saw these two games. Like, this is intensely stupid, but this is how we decide who gets to play in the conference in the playoffs because we have chosen to do everything the dumbest possible way in college football. So it's it you know and is ryan day you know managing that game specifically with the college football playoff committee in mind no probably not but the reality is that's kind of one of the things that that ends up being a conversation point later on you know you can you can absolutely hear gary gary barter talking about the data points involving these two conferences going head to head and yada 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 so you can also probably hear my eyes rolling right now uh let's see he, there was there was a couple of good ones a couple of people had some good uh, quick hitter ones mount p buck uh Let's see. Penn State loses five games. That, that's that's pretty bold. Well, I um, I mean, they almost did it last year, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we know it's possible. Um, that that is pretty bold. But again, on the over on the win total show, I was going to go under nine on Penn State, or maybe I did. Uh, no, I was going to, but five is still five is is pretty bold. I don't I don't think it'll happen. W- one of the reasons. I, Phil Steele has Penn State as one of his most improved teams. So usually when Phil's most improved teams, when he's talking about and he's putting all of the, these data points, usually you want to pay attention to that. So um, I'm going to go, uh, that, that's bold, but I disagree with it. All right. I'm, I'm with you there. I, I don't think they're going to be fantastic. That's that's a nine and three team to me, not a seven and five team. Uh, let's see, noon and 40. I'm going to give you three of them here. The first one uh, we have, we covered on our, uh, on our, uh, conference predictions or our over under win total predictions show on the morning scoop last week. So go back and listen to that one. If you want to hear your thoughts on this, just want to going to share it. Michigan finishes six and six, including a loss to Michigan state. Sorry. This is the bold prediction show, not the, this is what's going to happen show. So here are two from noon and 40 to, uh, to uh, share his thoughts there. Iowa wins the West Rutgers is bowl eligible. Which one of those is more bold? Which one of those is more, uh, more likely to happen? Um, I think Rutgers being bowl eligible is more bold. I like Wisconsin to win the Big Ten West, but Iowa, you know, I have them maybe like a game behind Wisconsin. And once I get through all of my Big Ten position rankings, who knows what what I'll end up thinking. But um, Rutgers to a bowl game, I think it's going to happen eventually with Greg Schiano. As long as as long as we don't keep losing bowl games and maybe maybe adding some bowl games. Rutgers is, is eventually going to get there. They were a bowl team under Greg Schiano. He will get them. If Kyle Flood can get them to a bowl game, Greg Schiano can. So uh, does it happen this year? I, uh, Tom, honestly, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, would I be shocked if Iowa wins the Big Ten West over Wisconsin? No, but I, I think the, the bolder of the two is Rutgers in the, in the bowl game. What about you? Yeah, the, you know, I, I honestly think Rutgers in a bowl game is not even that bold. It's Iowa, Iowa winning the Big Ten West is maybe. I mean, that's it's kind of that's almost like a who do you have cross division between Iowa and Minnesota or Iowa and Wisconsin, because those two teams are both kind of similar to me, where they're both in the, you know, this is the exact same team every year, and this is just the good version of that team. Like this, this feels like, you know, Iowa might, Iowa might lose, you know, to Iowa State, but that doesn't hurt them in the Big Ten West race. So, yeah, I. 
I, I don't think either of those is particularly crazy. I'm going to run through the Rutgers schedule right now, just because this is listener service. And I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that not everyone has paid that close attention to Rutgers schedule. Temple, who is very down at home, that's, that's one, because Shiano has, has upgraded the talent. They've brought in a ton of transfers. That is a much different team than it was a couple of years ago. Temple at home is probably one. At Syracuse is quite possibly 2-0. and Delaware at home is 3-0. and At Michigan, they get, they get Delaware and Michigan. So they have two very slightly different helmets back-to-back weeks. That's exciting. Uh, at Michigan, we'll say 3-1. and Ohio State at home, 3-2. and Michigan State at home, you could win that game. You could absolutely win that game. So say 4-2. and At Northwestern, we'll give them a loss there. At Illinois, that's a winnable road game. You, you would love to get Illinois at home. You'd, you'd love to get Illinois and Northwestern at home, but those are two potentially winnable road games. Give, give them five there. Wisconsin at home's a loss. At Indiana's probably a loss. At Penn State's probably a loss. And then you end up with Maryland. And, you know, I mean, like, you're, you're, that's like five and seven versus six and six, that Maryland game. It's at home, end of the season. You're playing for a bowl. You know they're going to be playing. They're just playing their hearts out. Who knows what's going on with Maryland at that point? Like, I, I don't think Rutgers in a bowl game is particularly crazy. And I, are they still deciding like the five and seven bowl teams based on APR? I don't know what Rutgers APR is, but, uh, you know, it's entirely possible they sneak in on some stupid uh, technicality too. You can have that, both of those, that game, Maryland and Rutgers for a bowl bit. That would be like a championship game for those two programs. And just looking, I mean, Maryland was last in a bowl game in 2016. Rutgers last in a bowl game in 2014. So it's been a while for both teams, but uh, quite, quite a bit longer for Rutgers. That's, I like it. All right, let's, we're going to wrap it up with this one. I'm going to give you four and you tell me which is most, most bold and which one is most likely to happen. Okay. We're going to go to noon and 40. You have it in front of you. So I'll yep. read it, read it out. CJ Stroud passes for 40 plus touchdowns. Mayan Williams rushes for 1000 yards. Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson each have a thousand yards. Tyreek Smith and Zach Harrison each have 10 sacks. Which of those is the most bold? Which one of those is the most likely to happen? The most bold is Tyreek Smith and Zach Harrison having 10 sacks. The most likely is Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson having 1,000 yards receiving. I think C.J. Stroud throwing for 40 touchdowns is not out of the realm of possibility at all. Mayan Williams rushing for 1,000 yards may, may be the least likely of the three, and I don't think it's all that terribly unlikely. So I, I, I think there's only one bold thing here, and that's well, I guess C.J. Stroud is kind of bold, and you know, Mayan Williams is kind of bold, but you wouldn't be surprised by those. I would be surprised if both Tyreek Smith and Zach Harrison each have ten sacks because it's that's a lot for two guys to do. I think probably the last time the Buckeyes had two guys on the same team with ten sacks or more would have been Matt Finkus and Mike Vrabel, twenty-five almost 30 years ago now, 25 years ago. So it, it doesn't happen. And Tyreek Smith has been close. I expect him to actually get to the quarterback this year. Um, I don't, I don't think they, they both get 10 though. I, I could see them both being around, you know, do they, do they combine for 20? I think that's more likely than they both get 10. Now who gets the 12 and a half and who gets the seven and a half. I'd probably say maybe, maybe it's time for Zach Harrison to, blossom and then for tyreek smith to be the Ta- taekwon lewis to the the nick bosa or joey bosa of, of zach harrison so i think 20 is possible unlikely uh very unlikely that they both get 10 yeah there have only been i'm, I'm looking at the 2020 media guide but there have only been 10 people ever to record double digit sack seasons for ohio state chase young in 2019 vernon golston 2007 joey bosa 2014 mike frabel 1995 andy katzenmeyer 1996 Vrabel and Finkus, as you said, both in 1994, uh, Chase Young in 2018, Will Smith 2013, and Jason Simmons in 1991. So there, I mean, that's, there have been a bunch of guys who've been, you know, another 10 guys who were, you know, between eight and 10. So there's a bunch of guys who are kind of close, but getting a 10 is a lot. That is a really, really elite season. You just, you don't usually have two guys. And again, you know, that, you know, if, if, uh, if JT Tuomaloa and Jack Sawyer are also getting 12 sacks between them, like then you know, there, there are only so many sacks to go around at some point. So if those guys are playing more in the second half of games, then Zach Harrison and Tyreek Smith are not playing in the second half of the game. So the other thing is going to, that rotation is really going to go against them because they're going to be rotating those guys to keep them fresh. 
it's hard to get 10 sacks on 25, 30 snaps a game, no matter, no matter how good you are. So just that's, be- that's the other thing that makes that pretty difficult to get to. Uh, 2018. Did you say Chase Young had, did he, did he finish with like 10 and a half that year? Cause didn't Chase he- Young finished with 10 and a half in uh, yes. 10 and a half in 2018. Yes. He, he told us he would after the 2017 season, I believe <laughs> Draymond Jones had eight and a half that year. So mm-hmm. they came close, but um, you know, that's, that's a tough thing to do. And, and it's something that you probably shouldn't expect to happen. I think it would have happened if, um, you know, if, if Noah Spence and Joey Bosa couldn't do it, granted that was Joey Bosa's freshman year, you would like to see what those two could have done in 2014. Mm-hmm. I think, I think they would have done it. I w- I don't know that that would be a bold thing to say, those two guys go 10 in 2014. Unfortunately, we didn't get to, to see that through no fault of our own. <laughs> Everyone's fault, but ours. Uh, I think my favorite, just scrolling through the Ohio state quarterback sack record book right now. I think my favorite day uh, on this whole list is David Patterson, who against Michigan state in 2005 had three sacks for a total loss of five yards. That is one of the least exciting, one of the least exciting, uh, Tied for seventh all time in Ohio State history uh, games you could possibly have three sacks for minus five yards. And, and he probably would have had like six, but he's like, I'm not running all the way back there. <laughs> I'm just going to run like one yard from the line of scrimmage. And if the quarterback is there, that's going to be good enough for me. Uh, you know, Tommy Togia had three in one game last year, the year before that. Uh, so, you know, you just, you just need three of those. And then you know, just one more throughout the year somewhere. It's very easy to do. Uh, Tom, is that it? Are we done? Anything else you want to touch on? Uh, one, one more uh, on the completely polar opposite side. Uh, Byron Lee in 1984 against Indiana had two sacks for how many yards? Total total loss of two sacks. That's got to be two yards, right? No, total total opposite. Total one, total opposite. Pol, pol, 40, no polar, polar twenty seven yards. Ah, uh, thirty two yards. Two Holy sacks cow. for thirty two minus thirty two yards. I am assuming there must be a uh, bad snap in there or something. Yes. Nathan Williams had two sacks for minus 27 against Northwestern in 2008. Big Daddy had three for minus 27 against Illinois in 1992. Sam Hubbard, two and a half for minus 27 against Michigan in 2017. I don't even remember that game. I don't remember him. All, all I remember about that game is the, uh, the uh, Amazon show and Pep Hamilton going, John, no, John, no, why? Uh, oh, that's the only, I, I, I remember Matt, uh, uh, Mike Weber scoring a touchdown at the end of that game. The, uh, you know, the, the passer and Dwayne Haskins to Austin Mack that uh, set up the, uh, you know, and, and the Pep Hamilton thing. That's it. The rest of that game is just this big blank split. You know, it's just the monkey playing the symbols inside my brain. That's all I, I just remember those few things. But man, I, I will hear Pep Hamilton's voice inside my head until the day I did. No, John, why? Why? The, the, the afterwards, the, the post game where, Urban was so oh, mad, yeah. even, even after beating Michigan, just how mad he was that somebody attacked his quarterback. And, and then J, JT Barrett getting up there and like just showing, yeah, and then my knee went out. He's got the microphone like he's doing stand up and then just talking about it. And um, I don't even want to know what that post game would have been like had Ohio State lost because somebody injured JT Barrett before the game. That would have, oh man, um, Urban Meyer might still be talking. Like he might still be like, <laughs> and, and then one other thing, it's like, sir, we're trying to, you got, you've missed three seasons now. What are we going to do here? Yeah. Urban Meyer famous for wanting to talk a whole bunch after losses. Yeah. I, I, think, you, I think you may not be remembering, you may not be remembering the Urban Meyer era in quite the detail that you think you are. True, true, true. Well, there weren't, there weren't a lot of losses, but yes, the, the, the rare ones were, um, pretty pretty short and pretty quick and <laughs> don't need to be talking about those uh any any of these other t- other time that you want to get in or are we uh bold i i thought i thought that was i thought we were uh, i think we kind of hit the hit my favorites unless you have one you want to uh you want to single out but um no i'm just looking at from framby's avenue uh neither sam howell nor spencer rattler will be the first quarterback drafted every year somebody pops up like every mm-hmm. you know two guys pop up that mm-hmm you know, get in there and become the, the new big thing or like who, who was talking about Zach Wilson or who was talking about whomever at this point last year, or two years from now. And so I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't shock me. It just happens every year. And we see the more, you know, about a player, the more they slide down, apparently, or the more you get to see him like with Justin mm-hmm. Fields, 
and I don't know how he can look at what he's done and be like, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I, I'd give me the FCS kid who played one game mm-hmm. this year. I like, I like that. Who, uh, had, uh, started as a redshirt freshman and played a game this year. I, I like that. Uh, let's go with that. So, uh, I like this Tom. I like the show, uh, some pretty bold stuff, some stuff that, uh, maybe is, uh, going to happen. I mean, certainly somebody had to get something right here, right? You'd, you'd like to think so. I believe in our listeners. So I think, I think at least some of them got something right. Absolutely. Good. Uh, we, we want to thank them for uh, being part of the show that they had no idea they're going to be part of the show. But, you know, sometimes, hey, be careful what you write on the Ask the Insiders board. We may just steal it for content <laughs> and talk about it. So um, that's, that's easy. We actually need to do more of that because we work too darn hard on this show. As the listeners could tell when we discussed what we were actually going to be, how we were going to be doing this. <laughs> during the show because we hadn't actually talked it out. So wait, let's just, uh, let's go ahead and start ending the show now. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Reminder to check out BuckeyeScoop.com. Check out YouTube, youtube.com slash BuckeyeScoop. All of our videos go there. Hit subscribe. You'll be notified. Uh, we are also on to- TikTok. And when I say we, I don't mean me and Tom, although I am on TikTok just to follow Buckeye Scoop. So if Buckeye Scoop, they are on TikTok. If you or your children would like to follow there, uh, you can do that as well. And again, if you're not yet a member, uh, BuckeyeScoop.com, give it a try. Check out the Ask the Insiders message board. It is always hopping. And that will do it. Thank you all for listening and watching, and we will talk to you guys later.